Hello, if you are here for Science and Nature Untapped, you are in the right place. We'll give everyone a few seconds to join us. Perfect. So today we're looking at the breeding bird atlases, putting Kendra's birds on the map. A few housekeeping items um, before we get started. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, we encourage you to put your questions in the comments here on Facebook. And if you uh, are willing to share your location, we always love hearing where the viewers are coming from. So I'll give a countdown for your TV. Three, two, one. Gabe, it's all yours. So hello and welcome to Science and Nature Untapped, a free virtual monthly speaker series. My name is Emily Dureshi. and I'll be your host for tonight, as Stephanie could not join us. To begin our presentation today, we'd like to make a land acknowledgement. Um, so many of us are living on the unceded land and traditional territory of Indigenous peoples. We, great, we are grateful for the opportunity to live where we do, and we thank all the generations of people who have continued their responsibilities to Mother Earth since time immoral. Um, you'll notice that I did not mention what region we are in, and this is because we have viewers coming in from all these different regions. So you can go to nativeland.ca to explore what region you are in. I am right now on the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, more specific, the Mohawk people. If you are interested in learning more about the River Institute, what we do, our programs, we encourage you to check out our social media platforms. We have many events and education programs coming up. If you are interested in viewing the recorded version of this presentation today or untapped videos from the past, you can visit riverinstitute.com slash untapped. Coming events, next month for our speaker series, we will have the River Institute Year in Review um, put on by the River Institute, and this will be May 4th at 7 p.m. We hope you can join us. Um, so much of our research and our events are uh, put on because we have generous donors. If you are interested in making a donation to the River Institute, you can visit riverinstitute.com slash donate. Today, the grand show, we have a presentation about the breeding bird atlases, putting Canada's birds on the map. Our speaker today is Dr. Catherine uh, Dale. She began her ornithology career studying tree swallows near Chafee's Lock, Ontario, as an undergraduate student at Queen's University, and has since been fascinated by birds. She completed a PhD in biology at Queen's University in 2018, where she studied migration patterns of Western bluebirds and is currently employed by Blue, Birds Canada as the coordinator and of the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. She believes strongly in the importance of citizen science and loves that her job brings together two, of, two things she's most passionate about, that being birds and science outreach. Since her move to St. John's, she has been eagerly exploring the woods, cliffs, and bogs of Newfoundland and learning all about the birds um, of her adopted home. Without further ado, I pass it over to Catherine. Okay, thank you, Emily. And let me just see if I can figure out the technology. We've done this once, so in theory it should work again, right? Okay. Okay, and just uh, let me share sound because I have some sound that I hope the people uh, will be able to hear tonight. Okay, all right, I think we're good to go. So thank you very much for the introduction and thanks for having me. Um, it's kind of exciting to be giving a talk in Ontario, well, in Ontario, um, it, seeing as uh, most of my talks lately have been to people in, in the Maritimes and uh, in Newfoundland, but Ontario is my home and it is where I grew up. Uh, so Emily's done a great job of introducing me, but I'm just going to add a little bit more about myself. Um, so you'll notice that I pretty much only have the one profile picture because I've used the same one that I sent to the River Institute. Um, but I am an ornithologist. I completed my PhD at Queen's University four years ago yeah. now. Um, and uh, three years ago, I moved to Newfoundland to coordinate the Breeding Bird Atlas. 
And this started me on my way to becoming a birder. And some of you may think, what's the difference between an ornithologist and a birder? Uh, and I am here to tell you there is most definitely a difference. They are both interested in birds, but ornithologists are usually focused on one or two species of birds. Uh, so for example, during my PhD, I had two categories. If something was either a bluebird, in which case I needed to watch it, or it was not a bluebird and I didn't have time to deal with it. Uh, birders, on the other hand, are very, very different. So when I started this job, I realized I could no longer focus on just one species. And the birders that I've had the privilege to work with here in Newfoundland know every single little sound they hear in the forest and every possible plumage variation for all of the species here. They have skills that I'm still only dreaming of. Uh, it also doesn't help that birds in Newfoundland often have different names. Uh, so shortly after arriving here, I was going out to a seabird island to work with a colony of leeches storm petrels. And we were getting a ride out to the island from local, local fishermen. And as I climbed into the boat, he asked me if we were going to look at the turs. Now I know that turs are thick build and common murs, but that wasn't what we were going out to look at. So I said, no, no, it's the leeches storm petrels. And he said, the what now? And I said, the storm petrels. And he said, I have no idea what you're talking about, or at least I think that's what he said. Um, and uh, so we went back and forth for quite a while because I knew that he knew the bird I was talking about. He had more experience with them than I did, but I couldn't come up with the right words. And it turns out, uh, in case you ever need to know this, that leeches storm petrels are called carry chicks or mother carries chickens here in Newfoundland. So we did eventually work out uh, what it was that we were going out to work with. And then the last thing I put on this list is that I'm a science communicator. Uh, which is part of my current job, uh, science communication and outreach, but it's also something that I really, really enjoy. And it's a skill that I started to develop during my PhD uh, when I studied these guys, Western bluebirds. Um, probably some of you are familiar with the closely related Eastern bluebird, and probably many of you are aware that these guys nest in nest boxes. And because of this, uh, among other things, they are extremely, extremely popular birds. People love their bluebirds. Uh, they, a lot of people put up nest boxes in their gardens. Uh, they keep an eye on how the birds are doing each year. They look for them to come back each year. People love bluebirds. And what that meant for me is that working with bluebirds in a populated place like the Okanagan Valley meant that I got a lot of attention. So people were often asking what it was that I was doing, uh, especially when I was trying to catch bluebirds. Uh, it was very common for people to stop and ask what I was up to. And so communicating the research I was doing became just a necessary part of, uh, of my life while I was in the field in the Okanagan. And ultimately, it landed me my current job, uh, which is working for Birds Canada. And again, many of you may be familiar with Birds Canada. We are a nationwide uh, science-based bird conservation organization. Um, our tagline is that we are your voice for birds. Uh, and our mission is to advance the understanding, appreciation, and conservation of wild birds and their habitats. And we do this uh, through conducting strong science and establishing partnerships with government, both federal and provincial, uh, as well as other NGOs and industry. Um, but we also do it through programs that employ citizen science volunteers. Uh, and so this figure is mind blowing to me every time I read it. Uh, each year, Birds Canada programs engage the skills and supports of more than 70,000 volunteers nationwide. So that's 70,000 citizen scientists going out and collecting information about birds. So citizen science is a term that gets thrown around a lot these days. Um, some of you may also have heard it as uh, community science. That's also becoming common these days. Uh, but basically what it is, is public participation and collaboration in scientific research. Um, and it's sort of taken off over the past decade. And it's becoming especially common with respect to conservation and environmental protection. And what citizen science does, um, it does a number of things, but perhaps most importantly, it's pretty much the only way to collect data over the geographical scales at which pro ecological processes of interest occur. So things like shifts in the range of species or patterns of migration. I have the, um, I have the range map here for the American Red Start. Um, it's very difficult to track migratory animals over the entirety of their annual cycle. So that's something that citizen science can help us do. Um, the spread of infectious disease, 
broad scale population trends, impacts of climate and landscape change. These are all things that happen at large geographic scales and require a ton of data to track. And so this is more than a single scientist or even a group of scientists working alone can do. This is really where citizen science comes into play. Uh, it's also very helpful in that it reduces research costs. So uh, a single individual doesn't have to be in all of those places. And then it's really, really important to note that citizen science gets people involved in and excited about science. So, uh, you know, we don't want science to feel like a separate alien entity. We want people to get involved in it. Um, and I just have a really neat example of citizen science here. Uh, so in the previous slide, I showed you the uh, breeding, and mi breeding migratory and wintering range of the American Red Start. Uh, this map is, um, is from eBird. So this is an online program. Many of you may have used it already uh, where people submit their bird observations and this, the observations come from all over the world. And so what you can do with eBird is you can look at where people are seeing red starts over time. And so if this video works for me, let's see, here we go. So you can see we're moving through the year here and you can see that migration of American red starts through the States up into Canada and then back down again to Central and South America. Um, so that was all done with citizen science and we can track when birds are moving, uh, where they're moving, uh, where their stopover sites are, all of that can be done with citizen science. As I said, Birds Canada has a number of citizen science programs. Uh, so citizen science is involved in virtually everything we do. Uh, I work for the Birds Canada Atlantic office. So I have an example here of our Birds Canada Atlantic program specifically. Uh, in Ontario, you have the advantage of even more uh, possible projects or possible programs that you can participate in. Um, so we mapped them out here by the birding skills that are required as well as the level of fitness that's required. And that ranges all the way from Project Nest Watch, which is actually a national project. And essentially it's just a collection of data uh, when people observe bird nests. So if you happen to observe, uh, say a robin nest on your porch, you could submit that data to Project Nest Watch. And we're interested in things like, you know, uh, when was it built? Was it successful? What's the timing of the nest? And that information is used to uh, develop breeding ranges for the birds that breed, uh, the bird species that breed in Canada. Um, you'll see that some of them, you can get a whole range, uh, the Newfoundland Atlas, which I'm going to talk about a lot today. Really the uh, level of fitness required and also the birding skills required depends on how you're participating. And then we have long term pro programs like the Maritime Marsh Monitoring Program. There is also a uh, Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program in Ontario. Um, and those do require a fair bit of uh, birding skills because you're identifying birds mostly by ear. But today we're going to talk about atlases. Uh, and so as, as, I've, as I've been introduced, I am the coordinator of the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. I will say up front, there is also an Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas happening right now. Um, and I have tried to include Ontario where possible because it's more relevant to the people who will be watching tonight. Uh, but a lot of my examples are going to come from Newfoundland. It's my secret hope that I can convince you guys that you want to come out here and, uh, and do atlasing out in Newfoundland. So what is a breeding bird atlas? Uh, technically, it is a comprehensive systematic assessment of the distribution and abundance of breeding bird species in a jurisdiction over a five year period. Uh, so essentially, in our case, that means that we want to know the distribution and the abundance of all of the bird species that breed on the island of Newfoundland uh, between summer 2020 and summer 2024. It's a snapshot in time. Um, it's obviously a huge project. Uh, breeding bird atlases are immense efforts. Uh, Newfoundland is one of the smaller areas to cover, although we are somewhat hampered by our lack of roads and lack of volunteers. Uh, but no matter what, even Newfoundland is a huge project. And so there's no way that Birds Canada could do this alone. Uh, and breeding bird atlases are almost always done in partnership uh, with multiple government organizations, usually Environment and Climate Change Canada, as well as the provincial government, uh, other NGOs, industry partners. Uh, so we have a lot of partners when we are carrying out breeding bird atlases. And of course, the most important players in this are the citizen scientists. So breeding bird atlases are at their core citizen science projects. They don't work if we don't have volunteers contributing their birding information. 
So for a long time, as you can see from this slide here, breeding bird atlases were actually physical books. So those are, those are uh, screenshots of the covers of three of the more recent breeding bird atlases. Uh, however, um, these books, they're beautiful, beautiful books, but they do have some downsides. And the biggest one is that people needed to purchase them in order to get access to the information. So with our recent breeding bird atlases, we've actually moved to an online format. Uh, so this is the website of the uh, Manitoba Breeding Bird Atlas, which was completed in 2014. Um, so this one, I believe, was the first that was fully online all the way through, and it is an online publication. And uh, the core of it, if you go to the online book section here, um, you will come across a, a heading for species profiles or species accounts. And so what this is, is for every single bird species that was found breeding in Manitoba during the five years of their atlas, they have one of these species accounts. There's a photo usually taken by an atlaser, a little bit of a write-up about the species, and then those maps. And that's really the heart of the atlas. So I'm just going to focus on two of those maps here. Uh, on the left, you'll see the breeding evidence uh, distribution map for bobolinks in this case. I figured they were good species to go with because they are the uh, they are the species in the logo of the Manitoba Breeding Bird Atlas. Uh, so here you'll see these little squares, and uh, each of these colored squares represents a place where bobolinks were seen po possibly breeding in yellow, probably breeding in orange and definitely breeding in red. Uh, so this is the range of bobolinks in Manitoba. And we'll talk a little bit more about those different levels of breeding evidence in a bit. The other map here shows the relative abundance of bobolinks. So where is the core of their distribution? Where are you most likely to encounter a bobolink? So one of the major uh, benefits of having breeding bird atlases online is that it makes the information available to everyone. So anyone can go and get that information about uh, birds breeding in Manitoba or BC. Uh, Maritimes is now online as well, um, as is Ontario's last atlas. But the other really cool benefit to having an online atlas is that you can actually sort the information not just by species, but also by location. So you can, for example, let's say that you are planning a trip to Churchill, Manitoba to see polar bears, but you figure while you're there, you might as well check out some birds too. Uh, what you can do is you can actually figure out which Atlas Square Man uh, Churchill is in, and you can search by that Atlas Square and you can generate a summary of all the bird species that were reported in that Atlas Square during the Atlas. And so you can actually have a list of bird species that you would expect to see when you go to Churchill which I think is a really, really neat feature and not something that you can do uh, with, with the original printed books. Uh, so you probably picked up from the fact that I was talking about Manitoba's breeding bird atlas and I've mentioned Ontario. We do have a national atlas program. Uh, so this map shows you the, the number of complete atlases in each province. Uh, we haven't included the fact that Ontario is embarking on their third atlas and uh, poor old Newfoundland and Labrador here, we're working on that one as well now. Um, but you can see that every other province has completed at least one breeding bird atlas. We haven't tackled the, uh, we haven't tackled the territories just yet. Um, they will present some, some of the same challenges we're seeing here in Newfoundland. Uh, but the really cool thing about the fact that we have atlases in all of these provinces is that we can combine the information uh, to generate an idea of the nationwide distribution of bird species. So this is a map for the rusty blackbird, uh, which is a species at risk. And uh, you can see that it's combined information from the BC breeding bird atlas. Um, I don't believe they included Alberta in this one and Saskatchewan was not completed yet, uh, but you've also got the Ontario and Manitoba breeding bird atlases there and Quebec. So we can look at how bird species are doing and where we need to focus our attention at a national level, which is really exciting. Okay, so how do you do an atlas? And believe me, this was a question that I was asking when I arrived in Newfoundland. So when I arrived here, I took the ferry from uh, Cape Breton to Porto Basque, which is in the far southwestern corner of the island. And I drove all the way across the island to St. John's. It's a very long drive, it takes, about 10 hours, 10 to 12 hours. 
And the whole time, I just couldn't believe the size of the space that we were trying to atlas. So it seemed like a pretty terrifying task to attempt. Uh, but we do have some pretty well-established um, geographic parameters for doing atlases. We, we have a lot of experience doing them now. So the first thing you do is you divide your jurisdiction into atlas squares. These are your fundamental units of atlasing, and they're 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. Uh, so this is a map of Newfoundland showing our atlas squares. Uh, in case you're wondering, there are 1,485 of them, and yes, that is a number that I see in my sleep. Um, but we've also realized that it's very unlikely that we are going to be able to get to 1,485 squares in Newfoundland, particularly when large chunks of the island are not accessible by road. Uh, so what we've done is assign priority squares. Uh, so the black dots you can see on the map there represent our highest priority squares, and then the open white dots represent our second priority squares. And you can probably tell that this was done in a systematic fashion. Uh, so we're not assigning priority based on the squares that we think are interesting. We assigned it uh, systematically. Uh, one in every four squares was a top priority square. Um, the reason for this is not because those squares are interesting, it's because we want to ensure even coverage. So we didn't want a situation where, for example, we had lots and lots of coverage, say right in here, which is about the area of Gross Moor National Park, but then we have absolutely nothing in all of Region 3. We really want to try and direct people's efforts uh, into uh, basically as evenly as possible across the landscape. Uh, you'll also notice the different colors on this map. That's because after we divide a, a jurisdiction into atlas squares, uh, we, group those, we group those squares together into administrative regions. Uh, so here in Newfoundland, we have eight administrative regions. Uh, one of our regions you may notice down here is not in fact even in the country, making us one of the first uh, international Canadian atlases. Uh, that is St. Pierre and Miquelon, which is technically France, uh, but Biologically, it makes sense to include uh, St. Pierre and Miquelon in this atlas. Uh, so we have these eight regions. Each of these regions are managed by a regional coordinator. Uh, these are volunteers uh, who basically spend a lot of time and energy being the interface between us in the atlas office and the volunteers on the ground. So they are usually people who live in the region that they are coordinating and know the birders of the area as well as the birds of the area. And they do a tremendous amount of work and I really cannot express enough respect for the regional coordinators. They are amazing. Um, Ontario has also uh, divided the province into regions. I'm not actually sure how many Ontario regions they are, but I can tell you it's definitely more than eight. Now, some of you may be thinking back to that eBird map that I showed you um, of the Red Start migration and wondering why we need atlases when we have something like eBird. So eBird is a free program uh, run through Cornell University in New York, and uh, it does essentially what an atlas does. So it's a place for people to report their bird sightings, and uh, th that information becomes publicly available. So eBird is incredibly, incredibly helpful, but there are some differences between uh, atlases and eBird. And the main difference lies in the distribution and the evenness of coverage. So the organization of effort. Uh, so this is a picture of a boreal chickadee. Um, and this is the eBird map for boreal chickadees. It's a little bit blurry, but I think what should stand out to most of you is this big hole in South Central Newfoundland. Uh, this hole is common to most of the eBird maps for the island, and largely that's because there are very few roads in there and very few birders. Uh, so it's not that there are no boreal chickadees there, it's just that there are no people to record them. Uh, if you compare that, this is our atlas map after only two years of data collection, so we still have another three years to go. But you can already see that we are starting to target some of those areas that are blank on the eBird map. So atlases allow us to actually try and coordinate the efforts of, breeder, of, of birders and make sure that they're getting out to pretty much everywhere across a jurisdiction, as opposed to uh, really focusing their efforts on a few particularly interesting places. Um, I should add though that eBirds and, uh, eBird and atlases are not in competition. So they're actually designed to work together. Uh, in the States, they run their breeding bird atlases through the eBird platform. 
Um, here in Canada, we don't do that because Birds Canada has its own platform uh, for Atlas data collection, but it is compatible with eBird. And so we have made it easy for people to collect their observations in eBird and then transfer them to the Atlas or vice versa. Uh, so eBird is absolutely not our competition, but Atlases do things that uh, eBird can't. So now that I've told you how atlases are structured, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the types of data that we collect when we're atlasing. And really that breaks down into three different kinds. Uh, so we have incidental observations, general atlasing and point counts. Incidental observations are pretty much any bird anywhere. So you say that you are driving along a road and you happen to notice these Canada geese with goslings. Uh, you weren't out, birding. In fact, you're just going to the grocery store. Uh, but that's still information that you can submit to the Atlas because it is, it is a birding observation and we are interested in it. Uh, most of our incidental observations take place between May and August because that's when most breeding birds are here in Canada. Um, the date range shifts a little bit depending on where you are. So in Ontario, uh, late April is pretty important. Here in Newfoundland, we don't actually really get going with our migrants arriving until mid-May. Um, also, there are many bird species that breed at different times of year. So uh, owls, for example, great horned owls are already breeding. And so we would accept observations of owls at any time of year. What incidental observations give us is presence data. So if you're driving along and you see these geese and the goslings, you can say for sure that geese are breeding in that square that you are in. What you can't say is whether geese are not breeding in the next square, say, or something else like a common merganser is not breeding in that square. So basically it only gives us presence information because you're not doing a dedicated search. With the next level up, general atlasing, this is exactly what you're doing. And so this is how we get at presence absence data. Um, and what this is essentially is a square level search. So we have a goal of 12 to 20 hours of general atlasing per square. Uh, the season for this is pretty much the same. So primarily May to August, a little bit earlier in Ontario. Uh, but this does give us presence absence data. And that's because if you spend 20 hours in a square and you don't see any Canada geese, then it's much more likely that in fact, the geese are not there. Uh, 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers may not sound that big to you, or at least it didn't sound that big to me until I actually sat down and looked at a map. Um, the Atlas provides these maps. We have maps for every single square uh, here in Newfoundland and also in Ontario. Uh, and this shows you the, the square broken down by habitat type. Um, so you can see the different colors there. The uh, sort of pinkish color represents shrubland. Uh, the light green re uh, represents mixed wood forest. And the numbers in the legend here tell you the percentage of that habitat type in the square. So this square is 37% mixed wood forest, 2% uh, coniferous forest, 43% broadleaf forest, and 12% shrubland. And obviously there's some water happening too. Um, and this is really useful information because when you are putting in those 12 to 20 hours in that square, you want to try and divide your time among the habitats proportionally to their representation in the square. So here you would want to spend about 10% of your time in the shrubland and 40% of your time in the broadleaf forest and 40% in the mixed wood forest. Uh, and this is really important to remember because I can attest to the fact that Newfoundland forest is not always an easy place to be. Uh, and if it were up to me, I'd tend to stick to the shrubland. So sometimes you really have to make yourself explore those uh, somewhat more difficult to navigate habitats. And then the last type of data that we include in the Atlas is point counts. And point counts are basically exactly what they sound like. So these are timed counts at pre-designated locations. Uh, in the case of the Breeding Bird Atlas, they're five minutes. So you stand at a predetermined spot for five minutes and you record every bird that you see and hear during that time period. Uh, and we aim for 15 points per square. So once we have 20 hours of atlasing and 15 points in a square, we call it complete. Uh, the time window for point counts is a little bit narrower. Uh, because here we're really looking for the point at which the most species are the most vocal. And so here in Newfoundland, that is the 7th of June to the 7th of July. Uh, I believe in Ontario, it is late May to about the 7th of July. Um, so uh, it's something that you need to check if you're intending to do point counts, what that time window is, because we aren't able to use point counts outside the time window. 
Um, they're really, really important point counts because they allow us to generate abundance data. So that second map that I showed you for the bobolinks in, in Manitoba, showing where the core of the range is, where, where most of the bobolinks are found, that is abundance data generated from point counts. Um, that being said, they're also, uh, they, they're the hardest type of Atlas data collection. They're the ones that require the most specialized skills. Um, this is because most birds are heard rather than seen. And so in order to do point counts, you really need to be able to uh, identify your birds by ear and you need to be able to do it pretty quickly. Uh, so that picture there is of a good friend of mine, Megan Boucher uh, in Gross Morne National Park. And uh, Megan is one of the best birders I know and she was just ripping through that species list. Uh, she picked up everything during that five minute period and uh, I only heard about half of what she heard that year. Uh, when you're thinking about where to conduct point counts, uh, it's actually something that it's information that is provided in the maps. Uh, so you'll see the little marked locations along the road there. For this particular square, uh, you, would, you would do point counts at these particular spots. Now, as I said, doing a point count requires a very specialized skill set. You do need to be able to identify birds by ear. Um, and a lot of people don't feel comfortable with that. Um, additionally, some people uh, find that they don't have the ability to hear birds on the higher end of the frequency spectrum. Uh, and so in these cases, when people still want to participate, um, but they don't feel comfortable doing point counts, we actually employ bioacoustic techniques. And bioacoustics is basically just collecting survey data through audio recordings. So for volunteers who want to uh, who who want to be able to help with the point counts, we actually have these little guys here. Um, they're handheld Zoom recorders. You take them out on a tripod. You put on their little windscreen, which I think looks like um, a hat from one of the guards that guard the uh, the Buckingham Palace in England. Uh, and you you essentially record your five minute point count. Uh, and so I have a little clip of a recording here. Um, which is from one of the recordings I made this summer. And so let's see if it will play. Okay, so I'm not, uh, hopefully you at least heard the white-throated sparrow there. I'm not entirely sure how loud that was for people. That is our, that is our white-throated sparrow. Uh, but if you can listen to this recording very closely, there's also a crow calling in there, a yellow warbler, I believe another warbler. And right at the end, there's a chebec, which is the sound of a yellow-bellied flycatcher. So we can use these recordings to essentially collect point count information after the fact. Uh, the other type of uh, bioacoustic device we use is called an autonomous recording unit, um, and that's what my colleague is putting on a tree here. Essentially, this is a little recorder that you attach to a tree or to a fence post, and you program to turn on when you want it to make recordings. So unlike the handheld Zoom recorders, you don't actually have to be there to use an ARU. Uh, you just tell it when you want it to turn on and off, and you leave it there in the field and come back and pick it up a week later, a month later, a year later, uh, and you'll be able to collect your information. That's really useful, particularly in places that aren't accessible during the summer. So uh, in areas with ice roads, for example, you can go out in the winter, put up your ARU, it'll be there all summer collecting your information, and then you can go back the next winter to pick it up. Okay, we're gonna hear the white throat sparrow again. Okay, and then the last thing that I wanted to mention about Atlas methods is that they don't work for all species. So there are some particular uh, kinds of birds, for example, nocturnal species like the great horned owl you see there, or secretive marsh birds like the Sora you see there. Um, these birds, we don't usually pick them up on typical Atlas surveys. Uh, and that's, well, I mean, for obvious reasons. So nocturnal species, are difficult to pick up because most people aren't out birding at night. Uh, and then most species of marsh birds are highly secretive. Uh, they're difficult to see in the tangled vegetation of marshes. And people don't tend to wade into marshes to go birding either. Um, and so for these species, we have specialized protocols to detect them. Uh, and 
these vary between provinces. So here in Newfoundland, we only have a, a nocturnal owl survey. Um, in Ontario, there are both uh, marsh bird surveys adapted specifically for the atlas and owl surveys adapted specifically for the atlas. But these surveys generally involve two things. Um, first, you are largely detecting the species by sound rather than by sight. Uh, so it's really an auditory survey. And then the other thing is to increase our chances of detecting these secretive species, we do use playback of species songs to try and elicit a response. Um, so for example, for the marsh bird survey, it might involve playback of Sora song, which is maybe gonna work here. It's thinking about it. Or not. All right, well, we'll try the great horned owl. So great horned owls are sort of your quintessential owl species. They sound exactly like you think an owl species should. Uh, the sort of mnemonic that's used for them is who's awake, me too. Um, and a lot of owl surveys in involve playing great horned owl calls as well as solid owl calls, boreal owl calls to try and elicit a response. Uh, same thing with the marsh bird survey. And since it appears that my Sora recording is not going to work, I suggest that all of you go look up what a Sora sounds like, S-O-R-A. Uh, they sound like somebody at a party laughing slightly hysterically. That's what I always think of when I hear a Sora. It's a very distinctive sound. Okay. So we've talked a lot about how we collect Atlas data, but I also want to touch on what data that we're collecting. And this is one of my favorite things about Atlases because my background is in behavioral ecology. I study animal behavior. And so one of the things that I really, really like about atlases is that there is an aspect of behavior. We're not just interested in what birds people are seeing and where they're seeing them. We're also interested in what the birds are doing. Um, because with each bird observation you enter, you're also entering a breeding evidence code. And really observations are mostly only useful to the atlas when there is this breeding evidence associated with them. So what do I mean by breeding evidence code? Well, there is a standardized set of codes. Um, you might think that the only way to prove that something is breeding in a particular location is to go out and find a nest, uh, but that's not actually the case. In fact, there are many, many other codes that indicate confirmed breeding. So for example, something like this black and white warbler here with a mouthful of food, uh, if that bird is carrying a mouthful of food, then it's taken that food somewhere. So we can say that that bird is for sure breeding in that location. Uh, even if I don't stay and watch the warbler to find out where the nest is. Um, things like singing, like you can see in that savanna sparrow there, uh, they are slightly less, um, less sure evidence of breeding. So that would be possible breeding. We know the bird is singing, likely to attract a mate. So there's a good chance that they'll end up breeding there, but it's not confirmed breeding evidence. Uh, so you can see that there are sort of three categories here, we, or four, if you count observed. Observed just means you, you see a species, but it's not in the right habitat for breeding. Uh, we then have two types of possible breeding, multiple kinds of probable breeding, and then lots of codes that indicate confirmed breeding. And all of the confirmed breeding codes are two letters. Uh, so I'm not gonna go through them all tonight, uh, but I will just give you examples of each kind. Uh, so the first breeding evidence, type of breeding evidence code is just this X for observed. So there's a species and it's, you see it, it's there, but it's not in suitable habitat. Um, and so a really good example of this is a ring-billed gull uh, hanging out in the parking lot of your local supermarket. Um, chances are it is not breeding in the parking lot of your local supermarket, but you did see the bird and you can report it to the atlas with this X for observed. Uh, for possible breeding codes, there are only two. One is habitat, which just means a bird is in the right habitat, uh, but the other one is singing. So as I said, um, when birds sing, they're essentially advertising for a mate. Um, this also includes other kinds of sounds that birds might make that are associated uh, with breeding. So for example, uh, drumming of grouse or the winnowing uh, display flights of snipe. Uh, so our example here is this very, very enthusiastic bay-breasted warbler singing his little heart out. So that would be possible breeding.
When we move up to probable breeding, um, there's a whole, a whole range of behaviors, but a really good one is the agitated behavior or alarm calls of an adult in suitable nesting habitat during the species breeding season. And the example I have here is a greater yellow legs alarm calling. And uh, some of you may also recognize this photo from uh, the, the slides that the River Institute put together. Um, this is one of my favorite things, favorite species in Newfoundland and my favorite thing that they do. Even though they are a shorebird and they look like they have absolutely no business perching in trees, they've got these long wobbly legs. Nonetheless, when they are alarmed at your presence and they are very easily alarmed, they will sit at the top of a tree and they will alarm call at you endlessly. So imagine that, but over a 20 minute period as you walk past. Um, they, they take their protective duties very seriously. And this, in this case, would be a really good example of probable breeding. So clearly this bird is agitated by your presence. It probably has something around there to protect. And then of course we have uh, the confirmed breeding. So these are all of our two letter codes. Uh, carrying food is one of the most common ones, but another one is uh, FY for fledged young. Uh, so in this case, it's either the, uh, the fluffy little fledged young that aren't capable of going very far in the case of ultracial young. So those are the, the little naked ones in the nest uh, or downy young. So these are precocial birds uh, like shorebirds, for example, where the young are out of the nest pretty much as soon as they hatch, but they're still incapable of sustained flight for a while. And I think it's really important to highlight this code because we're not just looking for evidence of breeding, but we're looking for evidence of breeding that we can tie to a location. So if, for example, you were to see an immature uh, bald eagle, that's definitely evidence that some bald eagles bred successfully that year. But because those birds can go long distances, we can't necessarily say that that immature bald eagle that you're seeing bred within that 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer square. So it's really important for us to be able to tie the breeding evidence to a particular location. Uh, so when you have a little guy like this, which has to be the grumpiest looking American Robin I have ever come across, he was trying to figure out what was food and he was really struggling to do so. He ate a number of rocks first, uh, which is probably why he looks so grumpy. Uh, but this guy clearly is not traveling very far in this state. He's not uh, undertaking sustained flight. And so we could put him down as FY confirmed breeding, we know that he fledged relatively nearby and robins were definitely breeding in that square. Okay, so moving on from what data we're collecting, some of you may be wondering about data quality. And this is something that does come up in citizen science overall. Um, and that's because, you know, we have people who are not necessarily trained as scientists collecting information for us. And so we do need some kind of way of checking the data to make sure that they, they are doing things correctly. Uh, and so we do have a lot of checks and balances in place with atlases. Um, first thing is that you'll get uh, different types of questionable codes, essentially, where you try to put the information into our database and the database will say to you, mm, no, I don't think so. And that includes invalid codes. Uh, so for example, NB means nest building. If you were to say that you saw brown-headed cowbird nest building, that would raise some flags. And that's because brown-headed cowbirds are nest parasites. They do not build their own nest, they just lay eggs in other birds' nests. So it's extremely unlikely that you would see a brown-headed cowbird building a nest. And that would get flagged when it went into the database. Uh, then there are also what we call improbable codes. So these are not necessarily things that can't happen, but there's something up with that code that, that causes the data to get flagged. So a really common one is NU, that stands for nest used. Uh, people use this when they come across eggshells or when they come across, to, across a nest and they know what species the eggshells or nest belong to and they're confident that it was used within the season. So within that breeding season. The problem is that most nests and eggshells aren't actually all that unique. So it can be very difficult to identify either of these things to species. And it can also often be difficult to know with the nest, whether it was used during that breeding season or during the previous breeding season. So NU will always be flagged because it's, it's just a little bit questionable to use that, that particular code. Doesn't mean you can't use it, but it will ask you for more information. Uh, similarly, CF, so carrying food, which I said is excellent evidence of breeding. This is true, but only for passerine bird species. So for birds like the common tern that you see there and the American crow, 
you may see them carrying food, but it doesn't mean the same thing as it does for the smaller bird species because both, um, well, American crows will carry their own food over long distances before they eat it. And common terns uh, will courtship feed their mates. And so just because you see them carrying food, it does not necessarily mean that they are feeding uh, nestlings within that square. And so uh, that will again get flagged when you go to put the information in. Um, so happily, now that everything is computerized, these, uh, these codes get flagged right when you put the data in and you'll get asked for more information. Uh, and then again, we have our wonderful regional coordinators who are responsible for reviewing all of these flagged records for each region. Okay, so I've gone through all kinds of information about atlases, the kind of data that we collect, uh, where we collect it, how we collect it, um, but I haven't really told you why we collect it. And this is kind of a good question to address because it, an atlas is an awful lot of work. And so we really need to know that we're doing this for a good reason. And I think there are three really compelling reasons to conduct breeding bird atlases. Uh, the first is that really they are the only tool that allow us to uh, keep track of the distribution and the health of bird populations. And this is particularly true of species at risk like this bank swallow here. So atlases are designed to be uh, repeated at 20 year intervals. So that's why some of the provinces of Canada have multiple breeding bird, at, uh, breeding bird atlases as I showed you in that original map. And what this means is that we can actually keep track of what is going on with species over time. Uh, and so these maps are taken from the first and second Maritimes breeding bird atlases. The first one was conducted from 1986 to 1990. And then the second one from 2006 to 2010. And on the left here, you'll see a map of the probability of observation of barn swallows uh, in the first breeding bird atlas, so between 1986 and 1990. And then here, you've got the same map, the probability of observation in the second breeding bird atlas, uh, so between uh, 2006 and 2010. And then the third map shows you the difference, but you really don't need this difference map to show you that you were much, much more likely to encounter a barn swallow in the first breeding bird atlas than you were in the second. So this shows a pretty dramatic decline in the population of barn swallows, which is consistent with what we know about what's going on with aerial insectivores. It's not always bad news. Uh, so here you see the same maps for the blue-headed vireo. Uh, you see that in the first atlas, there were some places where you weren't likely to encounter blue-headed vireos. And then in the second atlas, they were pretty much everywhere. So you can see increased probability of observation in southeast, uh, southwestern New Brunswick, uh, as well as uh, southern Nova Scotia. Um, so sometimes we see increases in populations as well. Uh, but without things like breeding bird atlases, so these systematic, carefully designed, uh, rigorously done um, scientific programs, it's really hard to keep track of these large scale changes. And this doesn't just tell us about what's going on with birds, because birds are actually excellent indicator species. They're found pretty much everywhere. Uh, they're easy to see most of the time, and they're sensitive to environmental disturbances. Uh, so they can tell us about what's going on with the ecosystem. Uh, another major benefit to atlases is that they are an invaluable conservation tool. So we need data before we can make informed decisions about policy, about land management. We need to know what's going on. Uh, we can't know what's out there and we can't know what we're losing or what we're gaining uh, if we don't have that data. It, atlases also allow us to determine critical habitat for species at risk so we can really target our, uh, our conservation efforts. Uh, and then the last really important thing about atlases is that they're an excellent outreach tool. So they're a really, really good way to get people outside and enthused about birds and contributing to a really important scientific project. And on that note, I'm gonna finish off just by mentioning the two breeding bird atlases currently underway in Canada. Uh, one, as I've alluded to, is the Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas. This is the third Ontario Breeding Bird Atlas. They had their first year of data collection uh, last summer and they will be running until 2025. Um, and so they have yet to get a lot of results, but I just wanted to highlight some of the neat things you can do when you have multiple breeding bird atlases. So for example, for bald eagles, if you look at the map of squares where they were observed from Atlas one to Atlas two to Atlas three there, 
you can see a dramatic increase in the pocket in the uh, breeding observations of bald eagles. And this is really reflective of the species comeback uh, after DDT was banned and eggshell thinning stopped being such a problem. But you can see it very clearly when you compare those three atlases. Uh, on perhaps less good news story, uh, this is a purple marten here. And if you compare the atlas maps from the first, second, and third atlas for purple martens, you'll see a dramatic decline and also range contraction in, uh, in purple martens. And this is again, reflective of the decrease in aerial insectivores that we are seeing across the guild and across uh, the continent. Uh, so we're not entirely sure what's going on with aerial insectivores or purple martens specifically. There are some theories. Uh, but you can certainly see how Atlas data will help us track that decline. And now, of course, I'm going to talk about my pet project, which is the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, and we started in the summer of 2020. Uh, uh, just as a, as a quick note here, if you're trying to launch a major citizen science project, don't start in the middle of a pandemic. It's not the best time for it. Uh, that being said, we have been doing incredibly well. Uh, we've got some amazingly dedicated volunteers. And even though this is our first atlas, and so we're not able to make those comparisons that are so interesting for the Ontario atlas, I think that there are still some very, very good reasons to do the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas, most of which are just that Newfoundland is important for birds. Um, so we're known for our seabirds. We're the seabird capital of North America. Uh, this, of course, is an Atlantic puffin. Um, so we have the biggest breeding colony of Atlantic puffins in North America, uh, it just, just down the road from me in Whitless Bay. Uh, we are also home to the largest colony in the world of the leech's storm petrel, or as you may remember me mentioning earlier, the Carey's chick. Um, so actually Canada and Newfoundland in particular have 50% of the global population of uh, leeches storm petrels. And the biggest colony is on a place called Bakalu Island. Uh, so this is St. John's here. This is Bakalu Island on the Avalon Peninsula, but right up at the top there. Um, so in, uh, in 1985, the colony on Bakalu Island hosted a population of 6.6 .6 million birds. Uh, so that's an incredible, incredibly large colony of leeches storm petrels. However, we are seeing massive declines in leeches storm petrels. So surveys of this colony 20 to 30 years later show a 50% population decline. Uh, so that's 3.3 million storm petrels on Bakalu Island that have just vanished. Um, and it looks like breeding populations of the species are plummeting across the Atlantic. And we're not really sure why. Um, we do know that chick survival, so leeches storm petrels breed in burrows, uh, and we know that their chicks survive the breeding season really with very few problems. So it's almost 100%. Most chicks that hatch make it out of the, bur uh, out of the burrow. However, we're not seeing as many of the adults coming back. So adult survival from year to year appears to be about 80%, which is incredibly short for a long-lived seabird like the leech's storm petrel. Uh, and so currently work is ongoing to figure out what is going on with these guys. Um, it doesn't seem that predation in burrows is a, a big problem, but it could be that uh, they're suffering from shifting food resources. So as uh, fish populations in the sea are moving, it could be interfering with their foraging abilities. Um, another major issue is artificial light attraction. Uh, so petrels are often attracted to the lights on the offshore oil rigs near Newfoundland. Also, sometimes when they come out of the burrow, uh, they're supposed to follow the light out to sea. Some of them get confused and they actually follow the lights onto shore. Um, and so we do in fact have a puffin and petrel patrol here in Newfoundland where people go around and retrieve these birds from the streets of Whitless Bay and other coastal towns. Um, I guess I should add that uh, the, Newf uh, the Newfoundland, sorry, that the, the leeches storm petrel is actually currently being considered for listing by CASIWIC, so the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. We also have some unique subspecies here in Newfoundland. So this is a gray cheek thrush. Uh, Great cheek thrush, the species is distributed throughout uh, North America. So all the way from Alaska to Newfoundland. However, the, the subspecies we have here in Newfoundland is genetically distinct. Um, and so we're interested in preserving them. And in 2005, biologist Derek Whitaker, who now works for Gross Morn, was asked to formally evaluate the population status of the gray cheek thrush in Newfoundland. 
And because birders were saying that there weren't as many of them around, but that's not, that's, it's hard to say quantitatively what was going on. So Derek used uh, data from the breeding bird survey, which is different from the breeding bird atlas. And he found that, you know, they were relatively common on surveys up to 1984. But unfortunately, after 1984, uh, breeding bird surveys essentially stopped being done in Newfoundland. And so there just was no information from after that. Um, so birders were saying we're not seeing as many of these guys, suggesting there was a decline, but there was no uh, data to quantitatively, quantitatively back that up. However, in the early 2000s, Canadian Wildlife Service worked really hard to restart the breeding bird survey in Newfoundland. And Derek had more information to work with. And so five years later in 2010, he came back and looked at this population again. And what he found is an almost 95% decline in coastal parts of Newfoundland over a 40 year span. So that's a huge decrease. So this bird went from being found uh, on, you know, most at least 10% of stops on a breeding bird survey route to almost not being found at all. Um, and so these guys are also currently listed as threatened um, provincially, and they are also being assessed by Kasiwek for listing. I just wanted to come on and say a goodbye to our viewers on your TV Cornwall. Thank you for joining us this, uh, this month, and we hope to see you again in May. Continue, Catherine. Thank you. Sorry, I promised you I'd be short, Emily, and apparently I am not. I'm not doing a short presentation. Apparently I'm doing a long one. See, you get me started talking about atlases and I just don't stop. <laughs> I love it. Continue, continue. I am nearly done. Um, so I just wanted to highlight one other reason I think it's really interesting to do this kind of distributional survey like the Breeding Bird Atlas here in Newfoundland. Um, and that is to keep track of shifting ranges. Uh, so I think this is a great case study. Um, the guy on the upper left here is a boreal owl. And boreal owls for ages and ages have been uh, Newfoundland and Labrador's small owl. Uh, however, as of the last 10 years, we've started seeing this guy here, which is a northern sawwood owl. Uh, they're roughly the same size. Uh, they, they fill the same ecological niche. So they eat small mammals. Uh, they nest in tree cavities. And... Uh, we had our first breeding record for Northern Sawwet Owl in 2017, and since then they've been reported across the island. So it seems like we have kind of an invasion of Sawwet Owls happening here, a definite range expansion for them. But concurrently, birders are saying, well, we, we're not seeing as many of the boreal owls. And so it's possible that we're also seeing a range shift for the boreal owls, or it's even possible that we're seeing a situation where Sawwet Owls are competing with boreal owls and forcing them out. And so this is information that I'm really hoping that we are going to be able to get at with the Atlas data and uh, map out these distributions and the interactions between boreal and sawwet owls. So with that, I will just move on to my final plug to uh, join the fun. So I hope that uh, this has sort of explained how atlases work to many of you. And I hope that maybe I've piqued your interest in joining in on the, on the bird surveying. Um, so the example I have here is the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas website, but I have also provided the Ontario Atlas website, and they both work the same way. If you want to join the Atlas, the first thing you have to do is register as a volunteer. Uh, so up in the corner of the website, of both our websites, you'll find a little login button. If you press that, it will take you to our database, which is called Nature Counts. You can see hosted on Nature Counts there. So it will take you to the Nature Counts site for that Atlas. And what you want to do then is click on the sign up button. Uh, so even though we have separate Atlas websites, all of our data entry is managed through uh, Nature Counts. And the other thing that you can find on nat Nature Counts is these Atlas Square resources. So those maps of squares that I showed you tonight, uh, those, are, those are available through Nature Counts. And I'm just going to end by saying that even if you don't think you have uh, the birding skills to participate in the Atlas, you probably do. Uh, that's because we need observations from everyone. So most of you probably recognize this guy, it's a black cap chickadee. Uh, this is our current range map for the black cap chickadee. There are many, many squares where we don't yet have breeding evidence for black cap chickadees, but I'm sure that they are breeding in those places. So if you recognize a black cap chickadee, you can contribute to the Atlas. Uh, this is also true of the American Robin. Uh, so if you recognize an American Robin, as you can see, also many, many squares where we don't have breeding evidence for American Robin and things like the Whiskey Jack or the Canada Jay. Uh, so 
this obviously I've been showing you the Newfoundland maps. I don't believe Ontario has these species maps made up yet, uh, but the same thing will apply to them. So as long as you are only reporting the things that you recognize, if you're, if you're in doubt about what a species is, don't submit it. But if you know what you saw, then absolutely submit it. Uh, we, we really, really want this information from everyone. Um, other rules for atlasing are to bird ethically. So remember that we are not trying to bother the birds. Um, we want to keep them as unstressed as possible. Make sure you get permission if you're going on private land. That's less of an issue here in Newfoundland, but very much an issue in Ontario. Um, you need to be respectful of other atlasers, of the public. Uh, you need to be safe and you need to have fun. Um, and I will also mention that if you are looking to learn a little bit more about bird ID, let's say maybe I've inspired you to come to Newfoundland, uh, we do have on the Newfoundland Atlas website an entire series of webinars about the birds of Newfoundland, which you can actually uh, watch on YouTube, which take you through all of the species of birds that you'll encounter here on our beautiful island. And I hope that I've convinced some of you to join us in putting Canada's birds on the map. Awesome. Thank you, Catherine. That was great. A lot of those birds were adorable and some of them really did make me laugh like that angry Robin. <laughs> oh, he was so angry. Yeah. So angry. That was my first thought. And then you said it and I was like, yeah, it's pretty angry. <laughs> we watched awesome. him for a while. And I mean, we were also hungry and being bitten by black flies. So he looked kind of how we felt at the time. And yeah, no, he was, he was very frustrated by the number of things that were not food in his world. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and this was a great segue into the first question that we have from our very own Narianne Perel. So she's wondering, what is the best way for someone who knows nothing about birding, but who is nonetheless interested to start getting into the learning? Excellent question. Uh, watching our webinars, obviously. <laughs> kidding. Um, you actually probably want to start by downloading the Merlin app onto your phone. Uh, so Merlin is an app from Cornell University. It's free. And uh, what it does, so it's basically like a bird guide on your phone, um, but it also enables, it has basically a find a bird function. So if you see something and you wanna know what it is, it will ask you where you are, what the date is, what the bird was doing when you saw it. So was it on the water? Was it, you know, uh, flying around in the trees? Was it pecking around on the ground? Uh, it'll ask you roughly the size of the bird and some of the main colors, and it'll generate a list of possibilities for you. Uh, so that's a really, really great, great way to get started with bird ID. Um, there are also, so we have a bird ID for beginners webinar and uh, so does the Saskatchewan Atlas, which I believe is available on the Birds Canada main website. Um, so those are really useful because they take you through some of the main cues. Um, so for things like considering size, considering context, color, and I cannot remember the fourth one at the moment, but there is a fourth one. Uh, so that's a really good way to get started as well. There are many, many phone apps you can download. I personally also like to have a paper copy of a field guide. I find that really, really useful in the field. Um, so I would recommend in particular the Sibley guides. I really, really like um, these are guides by David Sibley. He does amazing bird drawings and has a lot of useful advice. When you're looking at the bird, spend all of your time focusing on the bird because birds leave, as it turns out, they do not stay still, they take off. Believe me, I have many, many, many photos of just like the edge of a feather or a bird butt to, or sometimes just a tree uh, to confirm this. So spend as much time as you can looking at the bird, taking note of the field markings, and then go to your field guide. Awesome, thank you so much, that's great info. Um, we also have a comment from Phil Ling. Um, he says, thanks for a great presentation. He's gonna head to the Ontario Atlas and he's interested in joining. Um, but Excellent. he is a beginner, um, but he's hoping that he can still uh, be helpful. And he knows that this will be a steep learning curve um, as well. He has a question. Do you use machine learning or AI to process bioacoustics and autonomous recordings? It's a really good question. It's an excellent question, actually. No, right now we use text. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> we have, uh, so sometimes our regional coordinators help to process those five minute handheld Zoom recorder um, recordings. And uh, then Canadian Wildlife Service, we're actually working with them to process the longer recordings from, on the, from our autonomous recording units. Uh, some of the companies that make ARUs, they do have, um, they, they have programs that do use machine learning. Uh, and they're really useful if you are, for example, looking for a specific species. 
So if you will have to go through a bunch of recordings to figure out, okay, I want to know where all of the Swainson's thrush are in here, then that type of approach is really useful. However, I don't see them replacing human ears for the ARU analysis anytime soon, because when what we're looking at there is just, we want to know everything. And we also want to know numbers. So a lot of it is about figuring out whether a bird you're hearing, like if you hear two calls and one is farther away than the other, is that one bird that moved or is that two birds? Um, and that's that would be tricky, I think, for machine learning, at least in the, the state we're in right now. Awesome. Thank you. And there's another question from Marianne and a question that I also have. So you're the bird expert. What is your favorite bird species? What's my favorite bird species? Oh, you know, <laughs> I was literally at a staff meeting this afternoon where the same question came up. Um, my favorite bird species is the one that I am holding in the profile picture that you guys used and uh, that I used as well. It's called a broad-billed toady. It does not breed in Canada. Uh, so that was in the Dominican Republic, but these things are basically flying neon green and bright pink pom-poms. <laughs> they are the most ridiculous birds you can imagine. Um, they take themselves very seriously. And I think the best thing about them is they excavate caves. They live in toady caves. They dig themselves little holes into banks. So yeah, I, I think that they are pretty much my favorite bird in the entire world. That is pretty cool. He sounds really cute. <laughs> very, very cute. Awesome. And I actually have a question as well. Did you find that participation in the atlases uh, changed because of the pandemic? So it's a really interesting question. Um, I, I did allude to the fact that launching a citizen science project during the, you know, right at the beginning of a pandemic was not easy. Um, so a lot of the outreach events that we would have held in person, and I think that Generally, you do get more engagement in person. Uh, obviously, we had to cancel those. We also that year weren't encouraging long distance travel. So we were basically asking people to atlas their backyards, uh, which in Newfoundland in particular doesn't get you that much coverage because their backyards are either in St. John's or Corner Brook or maybe Grand Falls, Windsor in the middle. So we had very, very clumped data. Um, that being said, I think we did benefit in some ways from the pandemic as well. Um, People, I, I think it's pretty well documented now that people got more into birding during the pandemic. A lot of people were working from home and so uh, we're watching birds out the window and a, a lot of people, myself included, I think found birds very comforting because regardless of what was going on in our world, they were just going about their business. And actually they probably had the best spring in a long time in 2020 because they weren't being bothered by as many human activities. Um, so for example, when all the beaches were closed, I'm sure the piping plovers were having a field day. Of course, <laughs> nobody was there to record that. So I don't know for sure. Um, but uh, so I think we did benefit from an increased interest. And I also think um, Newfoundland is, is quite large and it's difficult to travel around. And so having these more virtual webinars, I think has allowed us to reach some of the smaller communities here in Newfoundland that we probably wouldn't have been able to get out to, uh, to, to reach in person. So I think there's both been, there's been pros and cons to the pandemic, but not many people can say that there have been pandemic pros. So we're, we're, very, we're very grateful for the fact that a few of the things worked in our benefit. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then I have a question as well. I know that there are seabirds in Newfoundland, but um, other than the seabirds, is the species composition similar to Ontario? Uh, fewer species, many, many okay. fewer species. So we are entirely boreal forest. That's the, the whole province is just boreal forest, basically. That's our, um, so whereas you have a number of ecozones in Ontario, we really just have the one. Um, our species composition is also more similar across all of our regions than in some of the other atlases. So Saskatchewan, for example, the birds that they're seeing in the southern part in the grasslands are totally different than the suite of species they're seeing up north in the boreal forest. Um, so for us, we do have a pretty homogenous grouping of species. Uh, it is fewer species, but if you are a beginning birder like me, that is not a bad thing uh, because it's, uh, it's a good way to you know, ease yourself into the birding thing. Um, and then we do have, like I said, those unique subspecies. So things like the gray cheek thrush and also red crossbill and a number of our other, um, other species, we have unique subspecies here and seabirds, lots and lots of seabirds. So some of the most amazing uh, seabird colonies you'll ever come across. Awesome. And then another question that uh, me and Courtney came up with together. Um, do you ever pick up on other animals with the bioacoustics? 
Uh, yeah, well, actually, when I was going through the recordings to find a good one to, to add into the presentation today, there was a recording that was almost entirely dominated by green frogs. That's all you could hear, just the green frogs. I'm pretty sure there was a Swainson's thrush like way in the background. Uh, so yeah, we do pick up on frogs. Um, that being said, honestly, there aren't that many frog species here. So there's not all that much uh, to get in the way of, of the, the sound that we're picking up with the ARUs. Uh, thus far, we have not uh, been able to find an ARU that it allows us to record both ultrasonically so that, and, uh, and within the, the hearing range so that we could pick up on bats. I actually really wish we could find that because it would be really, really useful to be able to use our data uh, and contribute it to the, the bat projects that are going on across Canada as well. But unfortunately, it doesn't seem that one machine can do that yet. I think we'd like that here too. We have a, a bat biologist in a in house here at the River Institute. So yeah, that would be awesome. Let us know I, if you come across that technology. <laughs> well, okay, technically I'm not I'm not fully say, telling the full truth here. There is an ARU that will do that. The problem okay. is that it only records uh, within our hearing range. It will only record in mono. It doesn't record in stereo. And because I was saying it's really important for us to be able to figure out if it's the same bird or two different birds. Basically we need to be able to directionally place the sound. So mono recordings won't work for the Atlas and there are no ARUs that record in stereo and also record ultrasonically uh, that we've been able to find yet. So if I do come across it, I'll certainly let you know. Awesome, thank you. So that looks like all the questions for tonight. We wanna to thank you for presenting at Science and Nature Untapped. Um, and yeah, if you have any closing words. No, no, well, I mean, closing words, join the Atlas and specifically <laughs> the Newfoundland Atlas. I mean. We, we are really hoping that uh, we'll get some Atlas tourists here. So come on out to Newfoundland. It's pretty amazing out here, uh, but also join the Ontario Atlas and contribute to the Atlas at home. And thank you very much for having me. Awesome. So we'll take this time to say goodbye to our viewers and we'll see you next month um, for our year in review.